Mike, thank you so much <laughs> for coming to the cave. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Dude, you have written a second book. I have, yes. Uh, there it is. We commiserated together over how hard it is to write a book. Yes. Even when you have help. Yes, and I've had help. Tanner Colby was my co-writer on this one. Uh, I was on my first, so we give him some credit there. And wonderful. It's a wonderful book. Thank you. I, I, Thank I, you. I was saying I, to you off camera, yeah. I like to think of my job here on the channel as being a permission machine. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like you've written a manual. A permission for this. optimist. A permission optimist. optimist. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry, but go ahead. Don't let me interrupt no, your no, good no, no. words I, there. I, I, I love that you've written a book of. As I was sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. But a few weeks ago on the yep. channel, I was talking about the fact that I have met some unbelievable geniuses, three mm -hmm. or four in my life, mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. to know that I am not even close. <laughs> I'm with you. And that the rest of yeah. us all have to make do with what we've got. Yeah, it's very humbling. Uh, yeah. And this is a book from the rest of us's point of view. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, it's uh, achieving achieving things that uh, you never, never thought would be possible. But it, it comes from my experiences, mainly my experience at NASA, the uh, lessons I learned, the, the lessons over the past few years, especially since I've left NASA, that resonate with audiences and conversations I have in doing shows like this. Sometimes we don't know what is gonna what is gonna be meaningful to people when we have right. a story. And some stories like, oh, it's always oh, really cool, you know, blast off in this fire and all that. Some people are like, okay, that's kind of cool. But when you get into some of the lessons about dealing with disappointment and and teamwork and leadership and how to recover from uh, from a tragedy and knowing when to pivot and appreciating the beauty around us when we see it here on Earth or in space, those are the things that seem to be most meaningful, those nuggets that people can can take away. And so that's what that's what this book is. It's well, kind of been vested in, by the by the people who I've spoken to over the years that this seems to be the, the top 10 themes that, uh, that seem to resonate. I, and yeah. I love that because everybody who gets to go to space seems to have an amazing story about the, the, the winding path yeah. that brought them there. Um, but, yeah. but your whole first chapter is about that winding path and you yeah. called it one in a million is not zero. That's right, one in a million is not zero. That is like, there's there's so much optimism in the, just that first chapter title. Yeah, and I, I, that was when I was trying to become an astronaut, when I kept getting rejected. And the, I, it, what that's a, a good phrase. What's good about the book is then we get to go into the, how did that come about? What, what was the story behind it? And I was uh, finishing up my thesis up at MIT and about ready to be rejected a second time from the I knew it was coming because no one had contacted me. Right, I didn't get right. an interview. So you know the letter, the bad letter is going to come. And this is and like, you've been wanting to do this since forever. Since, six, you since I was the six, I forget, I forgot, you know, I kind of forgot. I thought it was impossible when I was a little kid. So once I got to be about eight, I was like, ah, oh, it's never going to happen. <sighs> then I went to see the right stuff, the movie, the right stuff and changed my life. It rekindled that little boy interest I had when I was six years old with Neil Armstrong on the moon. And so I started pursuing that and went to grad school to, to try at least to attempt. I figured becoming an astronaut was a long shot, but maybe I could at least contribute to the program in some way. Yeah. But I had been rejected once. I was on the verge of another rejection that I knew was coming. And, and it was a, I was watching television and it was the Academy Awards and they went to the space shuttle. It was a downlink. They had like a statuette, uh, one of the Oscars there. And, and I was, and I knew with clarity that's what I wanted to do. Just seeing those guys Just seeing on that them floating downlink. around, I was like, that's what I want to do. And then, but it, the thought went through my mind was, but you'll never get to do that. That's impossible. And that's the way I felt about it a lot. Hmm. But I was at MIT, which is a lot of math going on up there. And I, I thought about it. Well, maybe it's one out of a million. But that's a number, right, Adam? That's zero point zero, a lot of zeros, and yeah. then there's a one at the end. That's a thousand people in China. That's a lot of. <laughs> there's, a, that's a, there's a lot. There's, there's a lot of zeros. It's a small number, yeah. but it is not zero. And the only, I think about that one. Think about that one at the end of all those zeros. It exists as long as you're trying. Maybe unlikely, but as soon as you give up, that one immediately goes to a zero as well, and your probability of success is by definition zero. You will not be successful if you give up. So. That's what, that's what that one in a million is not zero. That's where that, the title of that chapter comes and, from. And there's this beautiful reveal where you talk about getting into the astronaut class. Yeah. And now, one of the reasons you were rejected was because your eyes. You yes. did not have the perfect vision no. they required. that's right. And I did not know that you could train your eyes to be better. I didn't know either. <laughs> but when you're I learned that today. I know, yeah. everyone here's like, what? When you're desperate, uh, that's, that's all you have. So they didn't accept late, so I failed the eye exam. You didn't need to be quite perfect. I was like, you needed to be like 2150. If you were a, if you were a 
mission specialist. Okay. I think the pilots, the test pilots back then still needed to be 20-20. Yeah. Which starts to get challenging when you're older, well, right? Because yeah. you know, they're not kids anymore when you're applying to do this. And uh, I could not pass that 2150. I was more like around 2300 or so. I wasn't yeah, really yeah. that close, but a couple lines off the I chart, let's say. And uh, I, I couldn't do it, so they DQ'd me. And that, once you're DQ'd, you're done. They won't read your application any longer. So that's pretty. That seems like a guarantee that you'll never get. Right. It. That's what it was back then. Now all these rules have changed. You know, the, they've changed these rules now, and LASIK is accepted, and they, they don't even know if they have eye standards. And as long as you're correctable 2020, your eyes are healthy, Amazing. you're probably okay. You can check out. People are interested. You can go online and check it out. But back then, you needed to see pretty well. So they didn't. I don't know if LASIK existed back then. It was something called. Um, uh, radio keratonomy. Mm -hmm. But if you did that, you were done forever. They don't like that either. So, and I, I, I was, I was kind of bummed about this. And I went, I got that news on a Friday, and I go into work on a Monday. And the guy who was my boss at the time at McDonnell Douglas was Bob Overmeyer, mm -hmm. who was a retired shuttle astronaut. By the way, the sound we're hearing is the Blue Angels flying around is that San right? Francisco. Yeah, that's Blue. It's Blue Angels yeah. week here. Yeah, it's I week was week. here at Blue Blue Angels week. It was here. In, it was during October. 1984. You weren't even born then. <laughs> 1980. I remember I was here on a work, one of my first work trips. I was working for IBM, and I was staying downtown. And I like opened the shades, and these blue angels go flying by. Amazing. I was 16, so was, by the way. You were 16. <laughs> I was, I was 22. Okay. <laughs> so how long ago was that? That's like is that 50 years ago? No, no that's it's 40, like 40 years ago. 40 years ago. 45 See the years decades. Ago. You know, it's not even. I'm off by a decade. It's not a big deal. <laughs> getting so old here. But uh, but Bob was a, a former Marine Corps test pilot. And he knew, you know, he had, had written a recommendation letter for me and was encouraging me and through this. And he knew I was interviewing. He goes, how did it go? I go, I, you know, I, I got, I, I failed, them. I got DQ'd. And he goes, was it your vision? I, I said, yeah. He goes, oh, man, those, 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 uh, those tests really, they suck. I hated those things. Because as a pilot, he always sweated those things yeah, out. Yeah. And he says, you know what you got to do, don't you? And I go, what's that? He says, he says you got to dehydrate yourself. I go, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, that's what you got to do. He goes, you got to get all the uh, water out of your system. I would always have my, he said he'd always schedule his eye exam on a Monday, and he wouldn't drink anything starting on Friday. Oh, my God. And he would, he, yeah, he would, not, he would run the whole a time. Splitting headache. Get all the water. It didn't matter. This is, you know, this is his life. <laughs> right, right. And he would, and I said, how does that work? And he said, oh, it flattens the eyeball and dries it, and, and, if, and the light bends. He's going on a whiteboard, you know, telling me this is how it works. I'm like, all right, I'll try that. That same day, I go to the Johnson Space Center. I'm going through the hallway. I see Kevin Kriegel. Yeah. Kevin's a, was a current astronaut at the time, an Air Force test pilot. And he sees me. He's a friend of mine. He says, what happened? I got DQ'd. He goes, your eyesight? And I said, yeah. He goes, oh, man, I hate those tests. They suck. You know what you got to do, don't you? I'm like, what's that? He says, you got to drink a lot of water. <laughs> this is on the same day. You can't make this stuff up. So you gotta, and I go, why is that? He goes, it, you hydrate, the eye, eyeball becomes more viscous. I'm not sure if you knew what viscous meant. But the eyeball becomes more viscous and the light bends differently. So what I realized right then and there is no one knows what's going on. And this is something people have fought these things yeah. forever. And I've heard some pretty, pretty interesting stories about what people did to, uh, to get through some of these tests. And uh, so uh, I said, there's gotta be a way around this. And I looked, in, looked into it, found out about this vision training where you could, it's almost like a mind trick to, yeah. to focus beyond what you're looking at. It's kind of weird. Cause like we can focus here and then we can, can focus here and we're focusing at a first. So it's like, instead of focusing here, you're trying to look through the object. Oh wow. And it kind of comes into, it's like a mind trick. You're almost. like resetting your actual your actual you're, focus settings. It's, re, it's almost more of a brain training than wow. it is like an exercise for your eye. It was wacky. I can see Joey, so, my cameraman. Like, what? what this is not worth this? it. Just, <laughs> this is not worth it anymore, kids. Just get a pair of glasses. You know, it's not it's not worth all this. But I had to try to to improve my vision naturally. And and the flight surgeons at NASA were like, well, this won't work. But you're not doing anything medically to your eyes, really. Or, you know, you're not you're doing any procedure. Try. So, yeah. so I tried it and it, and it worked, and I uh, was able to requalify. It wasn't going to guarantee me a spot, but at least I could submit an application again. So. After after all of that, I love in the book you talk about how you're like you had gotten past all the barriers, and then it turned out you had to swim. Yeah, and that they, was a, they asked a, for the class to a, say once you're in you're in your astronaut class, they're like, yeah. "Good swimmers, raise your hands," yep. and everyone raised their hands. Bad swimmers, raise your hand, and then you raise your up. hand. Yep. And then they tell you. They told us that, I, I was worried about this because I was not a strong swimmer. <laughs> and I knew we had it, they, they warned us in our introductory letter, when we got, after we get, you get a phone call that you're in and you're all happy. And then the introductory packet of information comes and it said we were gonna have to pass a swim test and 
you know, come prepared because if you fail, it's going to set everything back. This is not good because we had to go through water survival training with the Navy. Oh, that's so, real. Which is kind of, sounds yeah. cool, but then you're like, I don't really like the water very much. So I'm going to have to <laughs> learn how to swim. And, you're from and Long was, Island. You don't like the water. Well, I, it was, I think it was more my Italian upbringing. Okay. You know, we didn't, uh, you know, you don't go mess around in the water. There's no reason. <laughs> if you want to go somewhere and there's water, you, it, we got bridges. Right. Look down the East River. There's bridges. There's a, the Brooklyn Bridge they built. My friend was in Brooklyn. And they didn't go swim for it. Let's go over the bridge. You know what I mean? They have a pedestrian walkway there still. There's no reason to go in the water. So we stayed out of it. I never learned how to swim very well. I was really skinny and always cold in the water. I never liked it. And now I was going to have to pass this test. And it had a bunch of elements to it that you had to do. And none of it sounded good. So I practiced. And I was a little worried, not so much that I maybe couldn't get through it, but that I was going to embarrass myself. Sure. You know, with all these high-powered test pilot military people. Right, these you guys know. with some real... Right, and I'm coming in as a pointy head to begin with, and now they're going to be like, oh my God, you know, what is, let's leave this guy behind. And uh, as you said, the, the, uh, the class leader, our sponsor, who was from a previous astronaut class, Jeff Ashby, said, who are those... You know, before he let us go home for the weekend, the, the test was coming up on Monday, and he, he said, uh, he said uh, who are the strong swimmers? And a couple people raised their hand, and he said, who are the weak swimmers? And I raised my hand. Charlie Camarda, who's from Queens, New York, also coincidentally raised his hand. An Italian kid from Ozone Park, Queens, also Amazing. didn't know what. So we, uh, so we raised our hands, and then he said, okay, everyone else can go home for the weekend, but the strong swimmers and the weak swimmers are going to stay after class, arrange a time to meet at a pool. The strong swimmers are going to help the weak swimmers with their swimming, because when we go to the pool on Monday, no one leaves the pool until everyone passes the test. And so I realized I'm in a, I'm in a different world now. It's, that, it's, it's a collaboration. It's, it's, yeah, it's, that's what it's about. The team success is what matters. And if you're good at something, your job is to help those who aren't. And there's going to be things where you eventually you're going to be able to help others. Now, everyone's not good at everything. But together, you know, we can get the job done. And so we met over the weekend, and we all took the test together, and we passed. Everybody passed. You know, we were talking earlier off camera about how Neil Armstrong famously did yeah. not do a lot of interviews. And one yeah. of the reasons was because of that ethos, he felt that to do a lot of self, bringing attention yes. to himself yeah. was actually denigrating the hundreds yes. of thousands of people that got him to the moon. Yeah, the patch, the Apollo 11 patch is unique. You, you probably know this. It's, no. but it's, it's the only patch. So if you go into our office in, in Building 4 South at Johnson Space Center, yeah. in room 6600, our conference room in the astronaut office, there are patches starting from Mercury 1, with Alan Shepard yeah. going all the way around the, the room till present day, whoever Amazing. just came back. Or they'll have, and even whoever just launched, yeah. that patch will be there. And so now it wraps around the room a couple times. Back then when I arrived, it was maybe almost like three quarters and one lap, whatever, anyway. Yeah. But there's one patch that does not have names on it of the crew, and that's Apollo 11. Every other patch going from Alan Shepard to the present day has the crew members' names yeah. on that patch. Apollo 11 has Apollo 11 and the Eagle on the moon. Their names are not on it, and that was that was Neil Armstrong. Apparently, that was what we were taught uh, was that, and what I've been told many times was that was his decision, because it was not about the crew. Amazing. It was about everybody. It was about the team. So it's that's the only inspiring. Yeah, I, my you better sure my name's on that patch. In fact, <laughs> yeah. when I see my patch, if I go back to anywhere, look, is my name's still on that thing? So uh, yeah, that's a unique individual, uh, but that's that's who he was. Yeah. yeah. I also love that at the end of each chapter, you include a, a bunch of bullet points about like the takeaways from the chapter. Yeah. I think that's a really, because this isn't just a story of your time through NASA and mm -hmm. the things you've learned. Yeah. It's more almost like a, a, a textbook of great advice. That's what it's supposed to, uh, thank you for that. That's what <laughs> we're trying to do here. It's, it's trying to be, it's, I was kidding around with my wife. I'm like, this is like a self-help book. It's a great sound. I was with my, my friend Charlie Holbauer. I think I mentioned in a book here a yeah. couple of times, a Marine pilot. One of our first trips was to uh, Marine Corps uh, Air Base uh, Yuma, yeah. right? Where we were there for, it, we, it was one of my first trips uh, in the T-38. It was, we went out there for a change of command or a retirement party or something. T-38 is what you guys T-38 was trained. our airplane. But he comes, so we, we stayed at the bachelor officer's court. We weren't bachelors, but that's where we were sleeping at. And, and, you know. So anyway, we're gonna fly home on Saturday morning and he knocks on my door and he opens the door and just as he looks at me, and this is, you know, a Marine test pilot, one of these jet, like a, you know, a formation goes over with that big roar and he goes, you know what that is, Mass? I go, what's that? He says, that's the sound of freedom. Is right, right there, you know, from a Marine Corps test pilot colonel. 
Um, so we got interrupted by that. But what was what was I saying? Oh, I said my wife. It's a self help book by someone who can't even help themselves. That's kind of what this this is. So maybe that maybe that makes it more meaningful. But it's it's a series of lessons and things to 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 take away. The idea is to try to give people takeaways that I found to be helpful. They got me through either the the adversity or disappointment of getting to the office, and then how do you get through challenges with teamwork, mm -hmm. with good leadership. Um, having trust in the in your in your team and in your training, uh, understanding that you're when you're given an assignment, it's because you're deserving of it, even though we might not always believe that. But your name's not picked out of a hat. You know, trust your training, trust your team, trust your gear, trust yourself. Th these things that I w I've been told mainly by other people, by other astronauts who I recognize in the book who taught me these things, um, and how I applied them and how they helped me and how. I think they apply to just about anything we're gonna do. It's not about flying in space. It's not a book for people who want to become astronauts right. necessarily. It's really about people uh, people who want to become whatever they want to try to help everyone uh, have a set of guidelines, hopefully, that may be as helpful to them, I hope, as they were to me. So this is what I what I learned through my through my years at NASA. What I love about this is you talk about being both an astronaut and a former astronaut. And while it's your story of becoming an astronaut, it's a wonderful guide to people to move towards those things that you want, but be ready to accept what arrives. Yes, yes. I, I, you know, you want to, you, sometimes the things are just put in front of our faces, right? And uh, you never know when that opportunity is there. And sometimes you just need to say yes to opportunities. You know, if, like even our friendship, I, I think it, with Bill Prady, yeah. so I, I was talking to him about something. So mm -hmm. you speak to my friend Adam, and I was like, really? I know, you know, the Mythbuster, I know this guy. <laughs> and it, it developed, you developed a, a, a very nice friendship, Agreed. at least from yeah. my standpoint. Uh, from mine too. I'm thrilled, right, 100%. that we're doing this. And you never, you couldn't plan these things out no. of who you're going to meet and what opportunities are in front of you. And uh, so always keep your, your, your eyes open. And I've heard one of my friends talk about that, um, like my friend Drew Foistel, uh, we were doing a talk together for some students and we were talking about this. I, I always felt like there's always chaos in front of me. Like, what am I going to do next? What's going to happen? And then I look behind me and it's like someone has written an orchestra. The way it all worked out perfectly. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful way of describing it. He, he describes it, it like, like Swiss cheese where if you look at his career, like it's like all these, these holes in just sort of ir irrelevant, un, you know, unrelated spots just yeah. kind of all over the place. But he turns around and all those holes have lined up perfectly for on a straight line. And you just can't plan these things that are going to happen, I think. You, I think it's important to have passion for what you do and an interest and be willing, if you have a dream, not you, you can't give up. Um, but to, to know, like, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then this is going to happen. You're probably going to be disappointed. So that doesn't mean it can't happen but it's probably not gonna happen the way you think it's gonna happen. Yeah. So be prepared to pivot, be prepared for something to change, an opportunity that you would never, you could never imagine uh, might be put in front of you and, and be, ready, be ready for it. Because uh, you know, things, things do work out Like being somehow. on a nationally syndicated television That's show. right, you <laughs> never know how that's gonna, like, that, that, that show led me to Bill Prady, the Big Bang Theory, led me to you and what we're doing here today. So, so the book is... Can't plan this stuff, kids. The book is Moonshot, a NASA, <clears throat> a NASA Astronaut's Guide to Achieving the Impossible. Mike Massimino, thank you oh, so much, my friend. Adam, thanks for having me. Absolutely. What a, what, a, what a great conversation to have with you in this beautiful setting here, man. It's awesome. I brought the space drill just oh, to make yeah, you feel man, comfortable. A power tool. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Drills make holes. We try not to do that. Oh, but, yeah, we call it the power the tool, power not the tool. drill. I used to call it a drill, and yeah. John Grunsfeld said, that's not a drill. It's a power. He, he said it kind of nice. Like he, was, he was like, you know, it's interesting you call it a power uh, drill because I've never heard that before. We it's a power tool. <laughs> it was his way of saying it's a, it's a power yeah, tool. Yeah. That's but, a very uh, yeah, polite way that's of a, yeah, getting it's a, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, this is our, our pistol grip tool. I want to uh, make, yeah. make this out of machine nylon, like the real one. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. I just like, I, yeah, I got this from uh, For All Mankind. Yeah. I think it's a casting of a real one. It looks, it ex looks exactly like we're missing the, the little bayonet. Yeah, oh, you got little, the bayonet yeah, over that here. Yeah, little nerdy. Yeah. The ear. But that's there. But yeah, this all looks about right. The, I mean, the display's a little bit different, of course. But you have these different collars and uh, uh, yeah, torque Yeah, huge sensitivity and torque. I didn't realize that it was all about the torque. high specificity. Yeah, of and torque. you had a torque limiter on the front of this. Yeah, it was more about torque than it was speed. 
the fastest it would go was 60 RPM. Right. So it was more about I getting know, the torque As soon as you right. get Not faster over, than that, your whole suit is spinning. You, and you had to hold on. And it yeah. gives you a good kick. That was the other thing you, you we trained like on this, uh, like a Peter Pan thing, like a pogo we call it, like on a, like on a, on a, uh, like a, like a pogo stick in reverse sort of, where you can go bouncing and you could push off of things and feel what it's like to fly around. Oh. You've probably been on these things like this, right? Kind of floating around. If you had like a, like a bungee sort oh, of. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We yeah, did the, some of this yeah. on, the, on our moon landing. Okay, episode. there you go, yeah. right, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if you do use the power tool, that way, you, and you're not restrained, you'll feel the kick from the tool. After your effort tightens, it'll give you a good kick. So you always Amazing. had to anticipate that of how you were gonna react the, the, the torque. So, yeah, it's a really cool tool. Uh, when, you, when I finish it, I'll have you back. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Count me in. Thanks, guys. Right. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Thanks for watching.